All right. Uh, thanks, Brad. And um, I noticed that uh, Sue Bloomfield, I noticed you getting in from the lobby. So welcome. Good to have you here, um, as well as all the yeah, other thanks. guests. Uh, yes, we have today. Um, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Court. And uh, by way of just telling you her present positions, uh, she's a professor with tenure in the Department of Medicine um, in Geriatric Medicine at UC uh, Denver Anschutz. She's also the Nancy Anschutz Chair in Women's Health Research. Um, and that's really a big deal. Um, yes, it's that Anschutz, right? <laughs> it's a really big deal. Um, and she has secondary appointments in the departments of OBGYN um, at Anschutz. She's an adjoint professor, hate that word, um, in the Department of Integrative Physiology at Boulder, and also the Associate Director of Research at the Eastern Colorado VA. Um, and I thought I would try to frame um, Dr. Court's career by comparing her to another well-known court, that being Margaret Court, um, the, uh, the, who is probably, you know, or probably hard to argue, the greatest women's tennis player of all time who's not named Serena Williams. Um, so um, Dr. Court um, has, you know, just to go through some numbers, has uh, about 200 peer-reviewed publications, another 50 or 60 invited publications. Um, Margaret Court, by the way, has zero. Um, if you look at Dr. Court's uh, funding record, and I'm just gonna stick with two grants of her, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens, uh, that, that with just two um, of her federally funded grants, uh, one being uh, the, uh, the uh, motor pack, the molecular transducers, transducers of physical activity, um, an exercise um, study, which is, you know, multi-site study, you know, presumably we're going to learn everything there is to know about how exercise actually manifests um, health benefits through this study. Um, that and one other study she's currently leading um, are just are $12 million in direct costs just right there. So um, if you added it all up, it would be a number that would be astronomical. Um, Margaret Court, by the way, zero dollars in grant. The other um, Okay, to be fair, Margaret Court won 24 Grand Slam singles titles and 19 doubles titles, um, and Dr. Court has won none so far. <laughs> <laughs> Post-retirement, she, um, she may be able to catch up. Um, but the other you know, distinct difference is that um, Margaret Court also has distinguished herself with you know, really, um, I would say, dated and not very progressive um, social views and is not really viewed as a, um, as a role model uh, by many people in 2020. On the other hand, uh, Dr. Court's list of people that she has mentored is a who's who of people who we know in the field and also people who are on this call. I'm going to just throw out a few. Matt Vukovic, Vukovic uh, Paul Arciero, um, Irene Schauer, um, Ed Melanson, Bob Hickner, Susan Reset, Rachel Van Pelt, Kerry Moreau. <laughs> Um, Kathy Jankowski, um, Sarah Wary, Kathy Gavin, Kate Leiden, um, Kristen Boyle. Um, it is really a, um, a, a who's who of um, people in our field. And in particular, she's been instrumental like no other person, I think, in terms of not only advocating for, but lifting up and supporting and inspiring women in science. Um, there is nobody who's done more that I have ever met in my life. Last, I just want to say that personally, um, Wendy has been an incredible mentor to me. Um, and when I have a difficult decision to make, um, she is not my first call, she is my last call. Um, and after I talk with Wendy, I'm ready to make a decision, um, which is enormously appreciated. And I have lots of gratitude for that. So without even more ado than I've already um, uh, promulgated, Dr. Court. Well, Barry, you've just set me up for failure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I can live up to that introduction, but thank you. Um, you've been a good friend through the years, uh, a valuable colleague now in Colorado. Very glad you are here, and um, I, I hope we can um, formalize more interactions between our institutions and advance our common interests in not only exercise science, but elevating women in exercise science. So with that, can everybody see my screen? Yes. yes. Good. Okay. I want to talk to you today about the acute catabolic response of bone to exercise, and that is not a typo. 
Um, ooh, my usual way for advancing slides doesn't work. There we go. So these four general areas um, I'll go through quickly. Ignore that typo. Um, talk about mechanical loading factors as uh, key determinants of anabolic skeletal response to exercise. I got a couple of slides just to show you that under some uh, circumstances there can be maladaptive responses of bone to exercise training. I uh, am then going to talk primarily about metabolic factors that influence bone metabolism and specifically the disruption of calcium homeostasis. And then I'll end with talking about some paradoxical actions of parathyroid hormone on bone. Um, just because in my experience, um, I, I think we in the exercise science community apply different definitions to some terms. I want to talk about some just very briefly. When we talk about weight supported versus weight bearing exercise, people have different thoughts about what each of those categories includes. If I put something like running up there, I think everybody would throw that into the weight bearing bin and swimming would go into the weight supported bin. But in my experience, people put weightlifting in either bin. I happen to think of it as weight bearing. We're not bearing our body weight necessarily, but we are bearing excess weight during resistance training. And other terms that we use probably more um, when we're interested in the effects of exercise on bone are whether the activity generates impact forces, high impact or relatively low or no impact forces. Here again, I think running is, is obvious. Swimming is obvious, really no impact with that. And weightlifting in this case is really low or no impact. Um, so um, that would be the category for this one. So in thinking about these terms and how they affect bone metabolism, what's important is that you realize that forces come into the skeleton to influence metabolism through two ways. One is through joint reaction forces. That's the action of muscle pulling on bone. Uh, the other way that forces can be introduced to the skeleton are through ground reaction forces. And there are very few, if any, activities that, that rely only on ground reaction forces. If there is a ground reaction force occurring, there is almost certainly a joint reaction force also occurring. So if I stood up on my desk and jumped down onto the floor, I would generate a very high ground reaction force, but my muscles would also be engaged to cushion that landing somewhat. So I would also generate joint reaction forces. If I would go up to the top of my house and jump off to the ground, there would be a very high ground reaction force and any joint reaction force I could generate would probably be meaningless. In that case, it would be only the ground reaction force impacting my skeleton and fracturing my bones. So I thought I'd start out with um, this, um, a, a brief overview of this study that was published recently from Rob Daly and others, suggesting that this is an evidence-based guide to the optimal exercise prescription for the prevention of osteoporosis. I'll start out by saying as a preface to this, I don't think we have the evidence yet to be able to design the optimal exercise prescription. But let me pick out just a few points from this uh, review article. One comment they made is that they don't think there, uh, well, they think there's evidence um, for walking as um, a therapeutic to prevent osteoporosis but that that evidence suggests that walking is not effective. They um, actually recommend resistance training as a primary form of exercise or mode of exercise to prevent osteoporosis. These are their recommendations of the type of exercise that should be performed. 
But they also acknowledge that the evidence for resistance training effects on bone mineral density per se are mixed and that they think the benefit of resistance training on preventing osteoporosis may be mediated not only by how it affects bone, but also how it affects um, muscle strength and balance and things that might reduce risk for falling. They also suggest that um, impact exercise um, and specifically jumping should be incorporated into an exercise prescription. But when we're talking about uh, older adults, especially older women, this may be a, a challenging type of exercise to implement. Um, and when you think about um, those types of exercises they're recommending, especially um, the, the jumping, that's based on knowledge that has been generated through the years about the types of ground reaction forces that are generated by those activities. So this is taken from a table in that paper, just picking out some activities, walking, stepping up a, a stair that's six inches deep or, or 12 inches, hopping on one leg, jumping side to side or vertically, or jumping off of a box onto the floor. And you can see uh, impact of these in terms of uh, ground reaction forces expressed as multiples of body weight. Um, and um, I also want to give you a little background knowledge on how that then applies to bone metabolism. And this is just a simplistic overview of uh, theories that have been developed over many years, but emanating from Frost mechanostat theory that suggests that the force that is applied to bone is going to result in strain that influences bone metabolism. Now, the definition of strain is um, the amount of deformation that occurs in bone when a force is applied to it. And the, the degree of deformation is very, very small. So this is usually expressed in units of micro strain. But Frost's theory was basically that um, strain determined whether bone was in a, sta in a state of uh, equilibrium, where the rate of formation, that's what this F stands for, is equivalent to the rate of resorption or bone breakdown and that it requires high levels of strain to push this equilibrium toward the direction where formation exceeds resorption and there is bone gain that occurs. And um, that probably, that threshold has been proposed to occur between 1500 and 2500 micro strain. Conversely, if the level of strain, uh, the level of force being applied to bone is very low, below some threshold of 50 to 200 micro strain, then bone metabolism in, is influenced in a way where formation um, is less than resorption, and this would generate a condition of bone loss. So this physiologic window uh, of strain that has been defined through the years um, has been used to evaluate whether certain activities are likely to be osteogenic, bone building, or not. So this was a study where they actually put strain gauges on the tibia of humans and measured strain during different activities. So you can see that walking is at the low end of the physiologic window, as is cycling. But activities like jogging, running, going up and down stairs, or jumping, hopping, and rebounding are, are uh, capable of generating strain in bone that um, are across a very wide range, and especially at the high end. So these are the type of activities that have been proposed as being better bone loading activities more likely to generate increases in bone mass and bone quality. So I've given you this background, um, starting from the, the, the daily review, that walking is unlikely to be effective in preventing osteoporosis. 
And yet, walking is the most common physical activity that's performed. And we often recommend to postmenopausal that the postmenopausal women that they should walk as a as a, a strategy to help keep their bones strong. Maybe not build bone mass, but at least slow the rate of, of bone loss. So I thought I'd pick out a few things from this paper, which uh, was published a couple of years ago, that looked at the osteogenic potential of different types of, of activities in postmenopausal women, and specifically focusing on the femoral neck, which is a common and very debilitating site of osteoporotic fracture. And they can't put strain gauges on the femoral neck in, in, in humans. So they took a, um, a non-invasive approach of doing this. They used kinematics using a 10 camera motion analysis system with markers on essentially every joint of the body and various points in, in looking at uh, where, where muscles both, both uh, insert and originate. They also then did joint reaction analyses across the hip and, and knee to calculate contact forces. And then once they had those contact forces, they also used finite element analysis to model how certain activities would specifically affect the femoral neck region. And don't ask me any questions more than what I've presented here about these approaches because I'm not a biomechanist and I don't understand it any, any deeper than what I've shared with you so far. So I'm gonna have a few slides set up in this format um, where we're looking at the different activities they had these women perform, which included hopping, running at different speeds, walking at different speeds, and then they had them do some resistance exercises that involved the hip musculature. So hip abduction, hip extension, hip flexion, and hip adduction. And I've just picked out three activities to highlight on all of these slides. Running about five and a half miles an hour, brisk walking at 3.7 miles per hour, and then hip abduction at 80% of the one repetition max. And this slide is showing you the peak contact force that was developed during these activities. Um, and you can see that walking really is pretty effective at generating a rel relatively high contact forces at the hip, not that much different than running and seemingly better than all of the uh, resistance exercises involving hip musculature. They also then went to, so that was, that was contact force. This is where they used finite al element analysis to uh, estimate what the strain would be at the femoral neck. And there are both uh, tensile and compressive strains that occur. So they looked at both on both the inferior and the superior regions of the femoral neck. So these are the peak tensile strains that they projected at the inferior femoral neck, sorry, with all of these different activities. And here, hopping was the most effective, but once again, walking and running seem to generate similar strain in bone and higher than hip abduction, even at a relatively high intensity. Looking at tensile strain at the superior border of the femoral neck, running now seems to be a, a little bit better than walking, again, both better than hip abduction. And then looking at compressive strain on the inferior region, um, compression decreases, um, um, uh, what am I saying here? Uh, it's negative strain, it's pushing bone together, so that's why we see the, the, the y-axis reversed here. Again, walking very effective, almost as effective as running, and greater than hip abduction. And then finally, compressive strain at the superior border of the femoral neck, 
Again, here, walking is, is uh, very good, better than running, and better than hip abduction. And I'll make one uh, couple of comments here. It's the superior border of the femoral neck that tends to be the more fragile region of, of that, that, uh, that bone region. Um, and um, the fact that walking seems to be effective at generating a relatively high level of strain in that region specifically, both compressive and tensile forces, really suggests that walking should be an effective type of activity for preventing osteoporosis and specifically preventing fractures in that region. So as key points to take home, walking appears to generate peak contact forces and strains that have osteogenic potential at the proximal femur and specifically at the femoral neck. And yet what I showed you from very briefly from the daily review is that walking intervention trials have been relatively ineffective at increasing or preserving hip bone mineral density. And in my opinion, I think part of the problem with this um, apparent disconnect between um, the the potential effectiveness of something like walking and what we've observed for effectiveness is that I think we have focused our research heavily on evaluating mechanical loading characteristics of exercise like contact forces and micro strain, but not given enough consideration to the metabolic factors of exercise and how that might affect bone metabolism. So let me give you an example of why I think this is important. Um, sometimes it's good to have somebody outside the exercise community review the, the evidence. So this was uh, the headlines from an article written by Gina Collada, who's a science journalist at the New York Times, who came away with the conclusion that exercise is not the path to strong bones, that there's this misconception that all you have to do is walk or do modest strength training, not sure I agree with that, to build strong bones, when in fact, based on her review of the literature, exercise has little or no effect on bone strength. I don't believe this is true. I think exercise is a path to strong bones, but I, I think as a, a community, we exercise scientists have not given enough attention to when, bone, when exercise is not effective at improving bone and why that might be. So um, many years ago, Dan Berry, who is an internist at Anschutz, wanted to join my lab and he was a former competitive road cyclist. So the first study he wanted to do was to follow a group of competitive road cy cyclists over time to see what was happening to their bone mineral density or BMD. And this is because we knew from cross-sectional studies that cyclists as a group of athletes tend to have low BMD. And he was interested in whether it was just because they weren't getting the benefits of uh, weight bearing exercise because their primary mode of exercise is weight supported or whether they were actually having some deleterious effects of that type of exercise on bone. So he followed these guys for a year and measured their bone density roughly every uh, three months and he found that during training co and competition, they actually had a decrease in bone mineral density that was not that different from the rate of decline that we see in postmenopausal women. And these were relatively young men. They should not have been losing any bone over this period of time. They didn't lose body weight, so they seemed to be in energy balance. He measured their testosterone, that seemed to be normal. So this. This at least superficially seemed to be related to their exercise per se. And this isn't an observation that is unique to weight supported exercise. Here's a study that was uh, published in a fairly rep reputable journal, JAMA, um, of, of 
NCAA basketball players. Now, if I was going to pick out an activity that had very high loading, bone loading potential, it would be basketball. They do a lot of jumping. They do sprinting. They do a lot of quick changes in direction. All those things should be stimulating bone to build bone mass. And yet over one year, these players lost 6% of their total body bone mineral content. <clears throat> and when they looked at the legs only, the decrease in, in BMC of the legs was 10%. I want you to remember this, this uh, figure because I'm going to come back to it toward the end of my talk. So those are two examples of um, bone not appearing to respond favorably to vigorous exercise. So let's go on and talk about some metabolic factors. Why might bone sometimes fail to adapt to exercise in a beneficial manner. My hypothesis is that there is the, an activation of bone resorption or bone breakdown during exercise that counteracts or offsets some of the benefits of exercise on bone that are mediated through mechanical loading. So, um, when I sat down with Dan Barry to decide how we were going to start looking at this, we talked about what some potential causes of the stimulation of bone resorption might be. We thought there could be a stress hormone mediated or cytokine mediated effect. Thinking about cyclists, they spend a lot of time on their bikes at relatively high intensity. So they're producing things like cortisol or interleukin-6 that we know are catabolic to bone. So we thought this was one option. We thought that low energy availability, even though he didn't see a change in body weight in the cyclists he followed, maybe um, modest changes in body weight could provoke this over time. Another consequence of low energy availability is a suppression of sex hormones, both estrogens and testosterone. Both of those have favorable effects on the skeleton. So maybe by suppressing those hormones, that could be a mechanism. And then the other one we threw through on the table was a disruption of calcium homeostasis during exercise. I let Dan pick which one of these he wanted to pursue. And it was this one. And I thought, this is a dead end. This one just isn't going to play out. It was on the bottom of my list, but it was the one Dan wanted to study. And boy, am I glad he did because I was wrong uh, and Dan was right. I think this is a very important factor that we have to know more about. So our working model is that thinking about um, the, the cyclists spending a lot of time on their bikes, they sweat a lot and there's calcium in sweat. So our working model was that because they're sweating, they're losing calcium through their skin, and that's gonna result in a decrease in the serum, serum calcium level. Anytime there is a small decrease in serum calcium, we defend that very vigorously. So there will be an increase within minutes of parathyroid hormone, and it can conserve calcium in a couple of ways, but one of the ways it acts most uh, promptly is by going to the calcium bank. It goes to bone and turns on bone resorption so that calcium is mobilized from bone. It gets back into the bloodstream to help stabilize the serum calcium level. And we projected that if this happened repeatedly uh, in people who exercise regularly, that this could contribute to the decrease in bone mineral density that is sometime, sometimes observed. We also postulated, oh, I have part of my animation not showing up here. There's supposed to be um, a box here that says calcium supplementation. So we also hypothesized provided exogenous calcium that maybe we could minimize the decrease in blood calcium level and meet uh, minimize all the downstream effects that, that that has. 
So we laid out a series of experiments that we wanted to do. And the first one was to test that first step. Is dermal calcium loss during exercise the major trigger for the decrease in serum calcium and then the subsequent increases in PTH and bone resorption, which we measure using a, a biomarker in blood called CTX. So we had 13 women, 12 men, young, relatively young, performed two identical exercise uh, sessions under, the same, under different thermal conditions. They did cycling for 60 minutes at a relatively high intensity, about 80% of maximal heart rate. And they did this in either a cool or warm environment. And based on what I had found in the literature, this difference of about 10 degrees C should have resulted in a 50% higher sweat rate in the warm condition compared to the cool condition. And in fact, that's exactly what we found. The sweat loss was about uh, 50, well, exactly 50% higher in the warm condition than the cool condition. The sweat calcium concentrations were the same. So during the warm exercise session, they should have lost 50% more calcium than during the cool condition. Here are the results, and let me walk you through this. Uh, let's focus just on the top panel first. So in panel A, this is the serum ionized calcium or free calcium fraction. You can see that during both the warm and the cool exercise sessions, during exercise, there was a similar decrease in ionized calcium. Just 15 minutes into the exercise bout, we start seeing this increase, a very abrupt increase in PTH and it stayed elevated for the entire exercise session, peaking about 15 minutes after exercise, and then essentially coming back down to baseline by an hour after exercise. So this decrease in serum ionized calcium resulted in the predicted increase in PTH, but no differences between thermal conditions. And one thing that was quite surprising to me is that we think of bone as being somewhat slow to respond um, to any sort of perturbation. But as soon as PTH started going up, 15 minutes into exercise, CTX was also going up, indicating that the bone resorption process had been activated and that calcium was likely being mobilized into the bloodstream. And again, no significant differences between conditions. Now, something about exercise that we wanna um, at least adjust for is that when we start exercising, plasma volume contracts. So the water fraction of blood decreases, which means all the constituents left there become hyper-concentrated. And we wanted to know whether these increases in PTH and CTX are truly because there's an increase in secretion of PTH and an increased um, bone resorption, mobilizing the CTX and calcium, or whether it's just um, a, a hyperconcentration due to plasma volume contraction. So these bottom panels reflect plasma volume adjusted data. So first of all, you can see that the increases in PTH and CTX are real. There's truly an increase in response to exercise. But what was really interesting when we did this manipulation is the, the, the change in ionized calcium levels. The first time I saw these data, I thought we had done something drastically wrong. I went back and I did these calculations by hand to make sure they were correct. And they are. And I also went back into the literature and I found studies back to the 1970s, one from Vic Convertino, showing exactly this same phenomenon that we observed here, that within the first 15 minutes of exercise, there is this huge efflux of calcium out of the vascular space. This is a decrease of one milligram per deciliter, which means 20% of the free calcium is leaving. 
And the change in total calcium is very similar to this. So it does not appear to be a change in calcium binding. It appears to be a true loss of calcium from the vasculature. I'll tell you right now, I don't know why that happens. I don't know where the calcium is going, but this seems to be the mediator of these other metabolic responses that we see. So if we go back to our model, just that one experiment uh, told us that our initial hypothesis that this was related to sweating during exercise and dermal calcium loss is not correct. However, we did see that serum calcium decreased, PTH increased, bone resorption increased, and we still don't know about supplemental calcium. So we decided to go to the next experiment and ask the question of if we could provide exogenous calcium to prevent the decrease in serum calcium during exercise, could we then prevent the increases in PTH and bone resorption? So we developed a novel approach, which we call the calcium clamp, to infuse calcium gluconate at a variable rate during exercise. We start the infusion 15 minutes before exercise and raise the serum ionized calcium level a small amount. Then we measure ionized calcium every five minutes, then adjust the infusion rate to maintain the ionized calcium level above the pre-exercise value. So we did this experiment in 14 men, again, young men, same exercise bout as the previous study. They did a control condition that was volume matched saline. So we always had to do the calcium infusion first and then replicate the volume that we had uh, administered with saline rather than calcium. So this is set up the same way as those, those last results I showed you. The green lines are the uh, control condition. So if you just focus on those, they are essentially the same as in the first experiment decrease in ionized calcium. We now extended the recovery out to four hours, so you can see the recovery here. Similar increase in PTH, peaking shortly after exercise, coming right back down to baseline and staying there for the next four hours. Same thing with CTX, increasing shortly after the start of exercise, peaking an hour after exercise, but very, very surprisingly, despite the decrease in PTH, CTX remained elevated. And as best as we have been able to determine, the half-life of CTX is only about one hour. So the fact that this is not decreasing over time suggests to me that the rate of bone resorption remains elevated to keep CTX that high. And we haven't done the study to know how long it remains elevated, only at least four hours. And now if you focus on the blue lines, these are the effects of the calcium infusion. So we were effective at keeping the calcium level above the pre-exercise level during the entire exercise bout. That resulted in the expected decrease in PTH, but it didn't prevent an increase in PTH during exercise. There was in fact a small, much lower than in the control condition, but a small significant increase in PTH and a small significant increase in CTX. And we look at the plasma volume adjusted data same thing that we had seen in our first experiment, this large decrease in calcium uh, from loss of calcium from the vasculature early in exercise. Our, our calcium infusion prevented some of this, but not all of it, um, and had little effect on either the PTH or CTX responses. In this experiment, we measured urinary calcium loss to see if maybe uh, Calcium is leaving the vasculature and then just leaving the body, but that does not appear to be the case. In fact, in the control condition, there's very little urinary calcium excretion. There was more excretion during the calcium infusion, 
but um, only about 32% of this difference between the two days in calcium excretion um, was um, uh, accounted for the infused calcium. So most of the calcium we were providing was apparently being used by the body. Despite the very large differences in bone resorption on these two days, there was no difference in bone formation. So we also have a blood marker that we can use to, to, to evaluate formation, that's P1NP. So increased resorption, no differential effect on formation. Uh, we've done a few more studies. I'm not going to share those for you, but one of the key questions we asked now was, does this disruption of calcium homeostasis occur only during weight-supported cycling exercise, and does it occur only in young adults? So Sarah Wary led these experiments where she did the same clamp experiment in older adults that we had done in young adults. Now she studied 60 to 80-year-old women and men and rather than having them do cycling exercise, she had them do treadmill walking at about 80% of maximal heart rate. Now in an older adult, getting to that heart rate doesn't take all that much exercise. I think this, this was a walking speed of about 3.7 miles per hour, which remember from those, uh, those uh, mechanical data that I showed you was pretty effective at increasing bone strain. Same kind of results that I've been sharing you now in older adults. The patterns of change are very similar. Decrease in ionized calcium on the con control day prevented by the clamp. Um, increase in PTH on the control day prevented largely, but not entirely, um, by the calcium infusion and increase in CTX over time, still rising after four hours, prevented in this case on the clamp day. And I'll just throw up the data from the, the, the young study, the study in young adults that we did to show you that these responses are very similar in older and younger adults and with treadmill exercise and uh, cycling exercise. Now that's looking at intravenous infusion of calcium. We've also done a series of experiments looking at oral calcium supplementation. This one with a meal given two hours before exercise. And you can see that on the high calcium day, which was 1,000 milligrams versus 200 milligrams, there is an attenuation of PTH and there is an attenuation of CTX. We also included a stable isotope of calcium in that meal. That's why there's this extra 15 milligrams in each. We did that so we could see when calcium is appearing in, in the blood after a meal. And you can see that after uh, two hours after the meal is when we start to see the rise in the appearance of, of this uh, isotope. So this um, is an important concept to our research that we think the timing of calcium ingestion relative to exercise is going to be very important if we want to rely on calcium absorption during exercise because small intestine transit time where calcium absorption occurs is only about three to four hours. So going back to our model, now we can add a check mark by calcium supplementation as being a way to mitigate this metabolic cascade. I haven't shown you any data in terms of whether this in fact affects changes in bone mineral density or not, and we have not done those experiments. But I'm gonna take you back to that study of male basketball players. Um, I showed you one year of data where they lost 6% of their bone mineral content. In fact, they continued the study for a second year and they provided calcium supplementation and they at least reversed the trend for changes in bone mineral content. And the unique thing about this study, although they didn't provide a lot of detail about it, is that they provided a calcium enriched beverage during practice sessions. So this is where this key factor of timing of calcium supplementation relative to exercise 
I think is going to be important in how it influences adaptations of bone to exercise training. So a couple of more key points here. There's a robust, acute catabolic response of bone to vigorous endurance exercise. This occurs in young and older women and men during both weight supported and weight bearing endurance exercise, regardless of their training status. And I think the mobilization from, of calcium from bone during exercise in a, is an appropriate counter regulatory response. And I think it occurs to prevent serum calcium from decreasing to a harmful level. As I mentioned, the reason for that loss of calcium from the vascular space um, is not known. So exercise activates both bone resorption and formation. Um, if we think of weight supported versus weight bearing endurance exercise, we've shown an effect on, on resorption in both. Um, effects on formation, the mechanical loading characteristics are likely to be better with weight bearing exercise. So if we think of there being a balance between bone breakdown and bone formation, the net effect of that is going to depend on how vigorously each of these processes are activated. So in this scenario, there could be a net effect of resorption that would result in bone loss. Whereas in weight bearing exercise, the net effect is more likely to be on the side of formation. And we know that resistance exercise activates bone formation. We don't know what effect it has on this, this resorption activation by PTH. And so uh, our research suggests that we might be able to minimize this activation of resorption by providing supplemental calcium. But don't start taking that calcium supplement before you exercise just yet because that hormone that we study, PTH, has paradoxical actions on bone. When it's elevated chronically, like per, uh, primary hyperparathyroidism, that is toxic to bone and it causes osteoporosis. But um, surprisingly, when it is increased transiently for only a few hours, then PTH is anabolic to bone. And in fact, we have PTH-like drugs, teriparatide and abaloparatide, that are used to treat osteoporosis. And let me just show you some of the actions of uh, teriparatide in this case. So these are um, responses of markers of bone formation and resorption to a single dose of teriparatide. So I think of this like a single dose of exercise, all the data I've been showing you. In fact, a single dose of teriparatide causes an increase in CTX, in resorption, which over the first few hours, there's no increase in formation or P1NP. This is a study that was carried out for 24 hours. It took 24 hours to be able to see an increase in formation. And here's a study that was carried out for only four hours. Again, an increase in CTX with no change in PTH. So this is somewhat similar to what we see with exercise. And here, in fact, those two study, first two studies were done in postmenopausal women. Here's the only study I've been able to find with a single dose of teriparatide administered to young men. So I took one of our studies and compared the relative changes in CTX to a single exercise bout versus a single teriparatide injection. And you can see that the effects are very similar, suggesting that whether it's an exercise-induced increase in PTH or a drug-induced increase in PTH action, it may have similar effects. But here are longer term responses to teriparatide. These are studies that were conducted over 12 weeks. On this top panel, these are studies of pre, um, sorry, postmenopausal women. And you can see over 12 weeks of treatment with teriparatide, bone formation marker levels more than doubled with relatively smaller increases in CTX. And even in other populations, spinal cord injured adults, uh, people with anorexia nervosa or premenopausal with idiopathic osteoporosis, 
you get this huge 100 to 150% increase in P1NP or formation with, with the exception of spinal cord injured people, relatively small increases in, in resorption. So exercise may have an anabolic effect, but we haven't observed that yet. So key points to take home here are that vigorous endurance exercise has an acute catabolic effect on bone as evidenced by the increases in PTH and CTX subsequent to a decrease in ionized calcium. The exercise induced increase in PTH may also have an anabolic effect, but the evidence for this has not yet been established. Based on those studies I just showed you, it may be that we have to follow people more than four hours to see the anabolic marker change, or it may take multiple exercise bouts to get that. So my current working model is that exercise influences bone metabolism through multiple pathways. It has the traditional effects on mechanical loading characteristics. I won't go into these in detail that are known to activate bone formation. Uh, we won't talk about that little footnote right there. But there are also metabolic characteristics that I think have been understudied. And we know some things about the characteristics that are likely to generate this PTH activation of bone resorption. But we do not yet know whether that activation of bone resorption by PTH transitions to an and an activation of formation, and whether both of these work in combination to determine what the effects of exercise training are, both on bone mass and on the quality of bone. Um, so I'll leave you with that. I do want to throw this slide up for just a minute to thank my entire research group, my funders, my affiliations, but I think as we go to questions, I'll just um, leave this slide up here and hope we have a few minutes left for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. We, I, my windows are open. I can hear people cheering all over Fort Collins, actually. That was a really well-received talk. Um, let's see, as always, if you are interested in, in raising a hand and asking your own questions, you can do that on the uh, flip side if you want to type something into the chat and uh, and have me ask for you in my worst impression i am uh, i'm also happy to do that as well looks like maybe uh sue is, is coming in with a, a potential question here sue you might be on on mute sue yeah go go right ahead Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we got you. Okay. All right. Well, I, 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 I'm not surprised, but your final slide anticipated my question. <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, all, your data is really compelling about this acute catabolic effect. And the more I thought about it, um, because I've seen many of these data before, and it has piqued my interest, certainly, is whether perhaps this acute catabolic effect may be um, a necessary event to ultimately gain a positive anabolic effect. In other words, I mean, it, we know bone remodeling starts with resorption followed by formation. So it might stimulate an increase in, in turnover that ultimately would end up in um, a net gain. But um, so you anticipated that in your final slide saying, well, maybe, maybe there's this long-term effect, but it still doesn't help us sort out those individuals who seem to actually lose bone, say over a cycling season or a basketball season versus those who don't or other chronic sports and training that does re results in positive impact on bone. Right. Because it's documented as well, right? Yeah. You know, the way I think about this is that um, if, if PTH is having that anabolic effect, P1NP levels should be relatively high in people who exercise regularly. And I don't think they are. 
And even in response to an exercise intervention, I have looked at this. You know, I showed you teraparatide data for 12 weeks with 100 to 150 percent increases in P1NP. With exercise, there tends to be a, maybe a 15, 20, 30 percent increase in P1NP. So the, the anabolic effectiveness of the exercise-induced increase in PTH does not seem to be as robust as with the drug. And yet, yep. the catabolic response seems to be similarly effective. Good point. Well, thank you. And I, is there, if there isn't another question, I'll, I'll, I'll raise one other thing, because this is, you know, theoretical. Our bodies can sense a lot of things about exercise. You know, we can increase our heart rate, our, our breathing weight, we can mobilize substrate delivery. But one of the things that we can't, our bodies can't predict, is how long we're gonna exercise. And if you were the calcium sensing receptor in the parathyroid gland, and you started seeing after 15 minutes of exercise, this, this relatively robust decrease in calcium level that doesn't seem to stop, you have to generate a robust counter-regulatory response. Because if that decrease in calcium continues, First of all, muscle contraction is going to be compromised. You're going to have some, some muscle spasms. If it continues, you know, this big muscle in our chest, the heart, can go into cardiac arrest. So we have to have a counter-regulatory mechanism to prevent a, dec a decrease in serum calcium. And that's why I think this is a normal response to exercise that we have been largely ignoring. See if I can get myself unmuted here. Thank you uh, very much. So we, we do have a few questions in the chat, and I think I'll jump over to those if you don't mind. So uh, Chris Bell from uh, up here in Fort Collins says, thanks, Wendy. Is an implication of your work that hot yoga, i.e. a sweaty activity without impact and or significant joint loading, is also potentially bad for bone? Hey, good to, hear, good to hear from you, Chris. Um, the fact that we found that it was not primarily related to dermal calcium loss means I don't know. It would depend, I think, on how vigorous that exercise is. Given that we don't know what causes the efflux of calcium from the vasculature during endurance exercise, I, it, I don't want to make any... Um, um, oversimplifications or generalizations to what how, how this might respond to other types of exercise. So the easy question is, I don't know. Uh, so I have the hardest time with this mute button here. Okay. Um, also, just, just following up to, to your prior point with, with Sue, we had a question of related to your last discussion point, but with repeated endurance exercise, we increase storage capacity of glycogen. So why not also calcium? Um, we might, but um, I, I still think that that diatribe that I just had about why we have to be able to mobilize calcium from bone during exercise when the serum calcium level is declining means that the body is going to go to the calcium bank to try to um, mobilize calcium back into the bloodstream as a way of defending that level. Um, ultimately, we could be turning on um, processes that do activate, keep, keep formation activated so that we replenish those calcium stores. But I think this is probably a very complex and dynamic regulatory system that we need to understand better before we can come up with the optimal exercise prescription. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we have a, a hand raised. We're gonna go to uh, Ed who looks to be uh, sitting outside in the sun. <laughs> I am, my outside office. Wendy Stellar as usual. Um, it was up pretty quick, but you had a slide where you put up Dan and Sarah's uh, uh, results on the same slide. And that's the first time I've seen them side by side. And it looked like the PTH response was much higher in the postmenopausal woman woman than it was the the, the, the young. Is that true? 
No, actually, um, the the scales were a little bit different on the okay. uh, on the two uh, sets of figures. We actually see a slightly dampened response in terms of magnitude in in older adults compared to younger. And I think, and I I, I want Sarah to uh, to evaluate this further. I think it may be related to absolute exercise intensity. We don't have a lot of evidence that this calcium is going to muscle, but that seems like a logical place since calcium is involved in muscle contraction. And if that's a ca the case, the, the absolute uh, level of exercise may be another determinant of this response in addition to relative exercise intensity. And so in absolute terms, it would be higher in young than in old. Okay. Do you think there might be some populations that might be more susceptible to having a catabolic response to certain exercises than others? Uh, you know, I would really like to study a, a, a cohort of patients who have had a parathyroidectomy because they can't mount a PTH response. Um, and it would be very interesting to see what happens to all of these calcium homeostatic dynamics during exercise in them. So, and I hope that's one study we can do down the road, but um, I, I, I don't know that we have the, that many of those patients around. Thank you. Well, thank you. I want, I want to be mindful of uh, everyone's time and our graduate students who really want uh, some alone time with, with Wendy as well. But we did have uh, some consensus of an excellent question within the chat. So I thought I better put that forward as maybe our final question of the day before we let people go enjoy their Friday. Uh, so Dr. Hamilton wonders, are there additive catabolic effects of exercise and teriparatide? Oh, Karen, if normally <laughs> you always pose these great questions. You know, I haven't looked at this in a long time. I don't think there's any studies that have been done in humans yet, but I think there um, have studies in animals, and they're they're um, not as straightforward as you would hope. And a lot of these animal studies, you know, when you start looking at um, at bone, Sue Bloomfield knows this well. Um, they they do tend to look at the, some of the same parameters of bone that we look at in humans, but they go mu much beyond that. So my my general impression is that some aspects of bone metabolism seem to be influenced independently, both by um, by exercise and by uh, anabolics, but not all of them. So I I think this is an area I have to get better educated in before I can answer that. Um, in a better way. Well, thank you again. I will uh, speak for everyone when I uh, applaud and say it was a, a wonderful seminar talk and we appreciate it so much. Uh, for those graduate students from CSU who are uh, enrolled in the 793 recitation and uh, for Dr. Court as well, maybe we can all take a, a little five minute break and go stretch our legs and, and walk around our tiny home offices for a few minutes. And then we'll get back in on that uh, other uh, team's invitation so they can continue to uh, pepper you with questions. Great. Thanks, Thanks all. This so was much. great experience. Good questions.